Welcome everyone. We're super excited to have you with us today. As Rosemary said, please go to the active jam board as to why you would like to become an educator. are interested in becoming an educator and realizing that that means a lot more than simply one kind of teacher. So. You ever seen a painting by John Trumbull? Founding fathers in a line looking all humble. Patiently waiting to sign a declaration and start a nation, no sign of disagreement, not one grumble. The reality is messier and richer, kids. The reality is not a pretty picture, kids. Every cabin meeting's like a full-on rumble. What you're about to witness is no John Trumbull. We'll get started in just about two more minutes here. an abrupt end to the song. Sorry about that, everyone. Hi, welcome in. This is, I'm Rosemary Wren, and I'll let Janet introduce herself if you want to say hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Janet Rios. I'm a bilingual academic success coach at Cuesta College in San Luis Obispo. Um, my pronouns are she, her, ella, uh, and I'm super happy to meet you all, whether it's virtual, and I hope y'all are staying healthy and well. 
And um, just as we're getting everyone signed in, we'll give people a few more moments to get all the way in. Um, so we thought we'd give you something fun to do while you're waiting. And here is the link. I'm putting it in the chat for the Jamboard. If you could share with us about your thoughts about teaching and um, why you're here today, maybe how, how you uh, think of yourself as an educator. And if you haven't had a chance to play with the Jamboard before, this is a great tool that we can use both in um, the online space and in person. So I plan to be using it. I'm not in person right now, but I plan to be using this in my face-to-face um, -face classes later in the fall. So uh, welcome in. I'll pop it in the chat one more time. And um, yeah, so uh, my name is Rosemary Wren and I'm coming to you from San Luis Obispo. I use she, her, hers pronouns um, and ah, I don't know, it just happened to my all my participants. There we go, sorry. Um, I am excited to be here today to share with you uh, what I know about becoming a teacher, becoming a transformative teacher here in California. Um, and so we're going to be talking about some nuts and bolts about how to get your credential. And then we're also gonna talk about um, some of the some of the other things that can help you to be an effective and transformative teacher to your very important students. Um, so we still have a bunch of people signing in, which makes me super happy. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the Jamboard, but you can continue to add to it because we'll come back at the end of the um, workshop and, um, and share that out. And so we can all see what you've added to it in the meantime. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and reshare. Janet, would you mind admitting people while I get started? And um, if you see folks coming in to the yeah. party. Oh, I think I need to make you co-host. Sorry. Yeah. You no, you're good. Some details. All right. So there we go. Um, all right. So again, um, Janet and I are coming to you here from San Luis Obispo. Give me a moment to get my screen organized, you know, always on the fly. I have to say I was in an international conference the other day and they made me feel so much better about my technology skills. So I just want to say I hope that you can be um, patient with me as I navigate through this. Um, and I will tell you right now, I don't know everything about presenting or about being a teacher. So I'm hoping to learn something with you today. So Janet and I would like to welcome you to our session. And this is part of this amazing program, Teach for LA, that's being offered all week long. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the land uh, from which I'm coming to you, and that would be the uh, land of the Northern Chumash, the Yaktitutu Yaktilhini. Uh, they are the original, current, and future caretakers of this land and culture of the area occupied by Cuesta College and Cal Poly. We are in Tilhini, the place of the full moon, and we gratefully acknowledge, respect, and thank the Yakti Tutu Yak Tilhini Northern Chumash Tribe of San Luis Obispo County and region, in whose homelands we are all guests. Uh, and, and for me, I feel that these are more than words. I try to be really uh, aware of the space that I'm taking up and the people who occupy this land. Uh, and from whom we can still learn so very much. They are very much an active part of our community here on the Central Coast. And I would encourage you to learn about the people in whose homelands you reside at this moment. Uh, very quick introductions. My name again is Rosemary Wren. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am in teacher preparation at Cuesta College and also at Cal Poly. Uh, where I am thrilled. I, this is my first year teaching children's literature there and I'm loving it. I come to you also from the uh, K-8 world. So I've taught every grade from kindergarten through eighth grade and now I get to work with future teachers like you. So I'm excited to be here to share with you something that I love and um, I'm gonna let Janet introduce herself and I'll let people in. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you everyone once again for joining us. Um, I'm super excited to be here and just to connect and just 
learn from you. And again, thank you for being in the space with us today. My name is Janet Rios. I'm a bilingual academic success coach at Cuesta College in San Luis Obispo, but I am born and raised. I live and remain in Santa Maria, California, if anybody knows where that's at. Uh, you know, we're known for our strawberries, our beautiful strawberries and our agriculture. Um, and so I just want to put that out there because um, it's a beautiful place. And I am uh, the advisor for feature teach the feature teacher club at Cuesta. So I provide uh, support to students who want to become teachers at the community college, putting on programs, bringing in speakers. I also uh, provide a lot of support in the dreamer in the monarch dream center, which is where we support undocumented students and their families. Um, so I also advise the dreamers United club on campus um, and work a lot with students there. I'm the vice president of the Latina leadership network. Um, and I do a lot of work in the community around supporting undocumented students through the central coast coalition for undocumented student success. So it's a coalition of educators at the college level who focus on improving and increasing services for all undocumented students at the college level. And we collaborate a lot with K through 12 to make sure teachers are trained, um, to, to, to make sure teachers are trained in supporting undocumented students. All right, so, thank, I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much, Janet. And if you have anyone like Janet on your campus, you need to go find her. Uh, <laughs> she is amazing and she is a big part of how our uh, future student, our future teachers uh, connect and build community. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started because I think we have more than we'll fit into an hour. So we wanna give time for, uh, we wanna give time for questions at the end. So I'll share just a little bit with you about our agenda, at least our intention here. Uh, first off, we um, will be sharing the link to these slides. So if you are taking notes, great. And if you miss something and wanna go back to it, we, we are going to share the link and we will also share um, the recording of this as soon as it gets processed and captioned. We're gonna go over some of the basics about California teaching requirements, the nuts and bolts. What do you need to become a teacher in California? Um, there's just some things you just gotta do. Uh, and then we're gonna share with you some different ways you can get there. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the less quantifiable things like the you can't check them off a list kind of things that help you to become a teacher, uh, why we might want to be teachers, and something that I'm exceedingly passionate about, in fact I just wrote my dissertation on this, is having critical conversations with students in the classroom to create a transformative learning space where you can encourage questions and learn from and with your students. So that's kind of where we're trying to go today. We'll see, hopefully we'll get through um, most of our share. I can see that several of you have added uh, your names and emails to the chat. I'm just, we're doing that kind of as a double check to make sure that we have contact information for everybody who's been able to join us today. So if you could do that at some point, I'll be saving the chat so that we can have access to who's here. If you don't mind turning your cameras on, we love seeing you, but we also totally respect and understand if you're having one of those hair days or there's a lot going on. Um, I personally enjoy when the baby goats and dogs and babies come to my class but I also understand if you've got stuff going on that you don't need us all to see. So, Rachel, um, uh, Rosemary, I love that you just yeah. said that because I literally was just watching Mona's daughter, I believe, come by. And as an <laughs> educator, the second you see a kid, you're like, oh, hey, like I wanted to like talk to the child. So thanks for allowing us to um, be where we are and encouraging us to open up our cameras, even if it's for five minutes of the, of the time that we're together. It helps to humanize it. So thanks for saying that. And Mona, thanks for your daughter being there because she literally made me smile. So please tell her that when she comes back. And well, before you sign off, Renee, Renee Marshall is the person you have to thank for this entire conference. So I hope that um, you will say hello to her when you see her here and in the other events. She First is, session this morning, I came appropriately dressed with my Princess Leia, may the fourth be with you buns. Yes, there um, you go. But I got to put them back on. So <laughs> thanks, Rosemary. 
Did you have anything you needed to share with us? Before? I just want to encourage everybody to keep being awesome and to keep showing up. I know it's an exhausting time of the year, an exhausting time of the semester for those of you that are teaching, those of you that are students, those of you that are parents. And so thanks for making the time for yourself right now. And it's, I, it's, I don't look very serious. Thanks. <laughs> But thanks for investing in yourself and showing up when you're able to right now. The numbers of you that are showing up to these sessions are inspirational. It's keeping all of us in the background going as we're, I literally just texted somebody saying, oh my gosh, they have 68 people in this session and you're already up to 71. And so keep showing up because that's what makes a difference. If you have a chance to open up your camera, please do. I also want to let everybody know that we absolutely are posting the videos at the recordings as we get them. People have already been watching. And so I will um, excuse myself and then I'll grab that link and I'll drop it in the chat. So we don't have everything yet, but as we get recordings, we are putting them up immediately because it's all about access. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, um, Rosemary and Janet for the moment to get on the screen with everyone and just this is going to be an exciting session. I'm, I'm excited about the content you have to deliver today. So thank you so much. Have Thanks a great so session. Much, everybody. Renee. Yes. And also um, something else I just realized if there's anybody in the meeting who is having any issues with um, with access or you're not able to hear us or you um, need any other sort of assistance, please drop it in the chat either directly to whichever one of us is not talking. So just either to me or to Janet and um, we'll do our very best to meet your needs in that, re in that respect. But I seriously have had a baby goat come to class and that like made my day. It was last year right after um, we made that rapid transition and I just have to tell you, it literally made my day. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into some of the details so we can get to some of the meteor topics and leave room for you all to uh, have some, you know, we can address your specific questions because we want this to be useful for you. Um, so there are some pretty straightforward elements to getting a teaching credential here in California. Rosemary, you went mute. I went mute. That yeah. you might be happier with me mute. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, so first of all, ah, there we go. Okay. So first of all, in California, in order to become a credentialed teacher, you need a bachelor's degree. You need to pass the basic skills requirement, which there's more than one way to do. Um, and you also need to pass the subject area requirement. I've put CSET there. There's other ways you can do that as well. And then you get your actual credential and get out into the classroom. Now, there, I'm gonna start with the basic skills requirement, which um, there's a lot of chatter about this right now. And um, it is a three-part, the, there's more than one way to meet it. And if you click on this link, it'll bring you to all of these lists with all the numbers you actually need. Uh, I'm not gonna go there right now, uh, for but this is a live link that goes to the CTC, uh, the California Teaching Credential um, website, where it'll tell you exactly like what scores you need on all of these other tests if you decide not to take the CBEST. The most direct route to getting over getting this uh, requirement over with though is the CBEST. It is a three part exam. Don't flip out. It's on basic math reading and writing. Now, I'm a horrible test taker. And so I understand if you if you have any sort of anxiety about it. Um, but the great news is they just restructured it a bit. And so they have it set up so that you're you take one piece at a time. Um, the whole test, like all three parts together would take you about four hours. And you can take it as many times as you need to to pass it. And in the past, if you didn't make it uh, the score you needed on the first exam, you'd have to go back and re-sign up for the whole exam. Starting in June, so essentially for anyone in this room who isn't already signed up to take the exam, it's gonna be available um, in modules. So you can take one part at a time, you can take it at home. They will be doing a proctoring, a remote proctoring um, situation but it's gonna open up a lot more space for people to take the exam. Um, 
I am personally not very fond of exams, but this is one of those necessary evils in California teaching to pass the basic skills requirement. It is possible if you took um, the CSU placement exam, SAT, ACT, um, oh, I have that twice, sorry about that, or you have AP scores that meet a certain level that you will not have, that you will have met the basic skills requirement, but the most straightforward way is to do it this way. Um, and once you take the CBEST, you're done. So any one of you who's in uh, a community college right now, we really encourage you to just take it before you go on to your next step because then it'll be done, it'll be over with. And I know at our, um, our campus, we offer free virtual um, workshops, uh, which we are just wrapping it up for this semester, but we'll be offering them again in the fall and all y'all are welcome. So we'll make sure that uh, Teach LARC has that information. So the CBEST is, like I said, it's kind of a necessary evil, um, but it's, it actually serves a purpose. It makes sure that all of us who are out there trying to teach young people actually know what we're talking about. So um, it, you as a teacher never need to know everything. You just need to know how to find it and how to think about it. And that's what this exam is gonna check on you. Um, so this is a traditional roadmap to becoming a teacher. You get a bachelor's degree. Oops, okay, it's gonna mess up my really cool graphic here. You get your bachelor's degree, you go on, take your CBEST. You can do that in different order if you want. You take the uh, subject area content test or you go to a school that has, um, has an agreement with the state uh, that will help you not have to take that exam, then you will go into a graduate program for your credential. You'll do your clinical practice or student teaching. We used to call it student teaching. Now it's called clinical practice. That's something else I work with. You take your, um, you take your final uh, reading exam and you're done. And I saw my friend Amy is in this call. She and Several people are working to make that go away, but until that changes right now, you do have to pass um, a competency thing that shows you know how to teach reading, okay? So that's your traditional roadmap. On the way there though, I know in the community colleges and at ours, we have several certificates that you can earn um, that help you along the way. And these are things that you can add on to your degree that look great on your resume and give you some really practical experience. So for example, I'm, I'm here from Cuesta. We have a certificate for paraeducators. So that's working with students in the classroom and you can do that before you even graduate. So that's a great certificate or you know, a, a focus or concentration, early childhood, Spanish. There are, depending on the school you're at, there might be certificates that will really help to enhance your, uh, your resume. So that's one thing you can consider. And then as far as getting your bachelor's degree, you know, there's more than one way to do that. And a lot of people are taking advantage of these opportunities at the community colleges. We now have the teacher preparation program that will help you get the prerequisites that you need to um, get into a credential program. And even if you choose to go into a pre-teaching major like liberal studies, um, you can kind of do some of those courses at the community college. But let me tell you a secret. You don't have to major in teaching to become a teacher. My undergraduate major, <clears throat> get ready for this. It's Russian studies. And that's before I actually had to make that up at UCSD, okay? So I, you need a bachelor's degree and a few prerequisites like the course that at my school is Education 200. It's Introduction to Teaching. It gives you some of your experience that you need in the field, and that'll help you get into a credential program. So check the program that you're aiming for. But these two courses here generally are prerequisites. I cannot say that word. Are prerequisites for getting a teaching credential or getting into a program. Then your credential program options are, are even wider. So after you finish a bachelor's, there's, um, you need a one, generally a credential takes a year to earn. It's considered graduate school. So you get graduate uh, school credit for it. 
I'm not going to complicate it now. There are programs that incorporate it into a bachelor's. Again, once you have an idea of where you want to go, you need someone like Janet and your academic counselor to help you figure out what you need to take before you, you leave the community college. But usually the credential includes your field work or student teaching. It's called different things at different places. You will take courses that prepare you for a couple of competency things that you have to show by the end. But again, these are wrapped into your credential program. You don't need to go out of you don't need to go outside your program. And then, oh, I have a tricky, tricky mouse here. Uh, then you can do your credential in person, which of course is the traditional way to do it. And I will have to say that a lot of people turned up their noses at online teacher preparation until uh, about a year ago, until we had to figure out some new ways to do things. So you can't, you will, still see that as the primary source, but Cal State Teach is a program that will pre that is intentionally an online program for credentialing. And so that's a great option because it's a CSU. And um, so it's a public uh, university and they are set up for online uh, student teacher observation. You still teach in person, but you don't have to actually go to a campus. Okay, and then there are also private schools that offer credentialing programs that are generally online. So that's these are great. These are great if you're already working, you can already be teaching in Cal State Teach. You can be getting paid um, and teaching and earning your credential. Going a little bit more off of the grid and into some other ideas about how to get a credential are district internships. And I confess to not being fully versed in all the options that are out there. So what I'm sharing with you here is um, the site, again, the state site for approved internships. But what the good news is for those of you who are joining us from Southern California, LAUSD has a pretty well established intern program. Um, other internship options are things like Teach for America, City Year, World Teach, AmeriCorps, and more. I have also given you a list of um, options here. Now, I am obviously not particularly young, and I did my credential the old-fashioned way, and I still like the way I did my credential, but my daughter is currently a Teach for America educator. And I have to say, it's a lot of work, but your first year is a lot of work anywhere. So if you're a person who thrives in that kind of a situation, talk to people who are in these programs or these internship programs, those might be a good way for you to go. Um, I'm not gonna tell you a best way, I'm gonna just give you your options and you can figure out what works best for you. So those are some nuts and bolts. And then again, these are excellent things to be doing while you're earning your credential or your uh, bachelor's because there is nothing better to prepare you to work with kids than working with kids. Um, and one of those things, that, these are all things you can be doing that earn you money. And yes, I put in-home childcare provider Yes, babysitting, being a nanny, those are all really, really useful elements that you can be practicing now while you're, while you're learning and you'll earn along the way. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and um, have Janet share with you some insights about uh, how she helps to prepare educators. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, yes, so um, you may be wondering, you know, like, how do I find out about all the opportunities available at my community college or at my four year, or what if I'm in high school and I wanna know now? Um, so I, I, you know, I, I challenge you to think about, you know, who is your community? Who is your person? Do you have that person you can go to at your school, at wherever you're at? to ask a question, you know, to ask for help, um, use your resources. And sometimes it can be hard. Um, I know it's really hard to ask for help um, or just even knowing what to ask. And so I just encourage you that while you're at your community college or your four year, even if it's just that one academic counselor, you're like, I know I have to go to counsel academic counseling, academic advising, your advisors, 
go to them. They will tell you, you know, these are the opportunities available to you. Um, you know, if you're struggling in a class, whether it's that math class that you need to pass for your, for your single subject, you know, go to tutoring. Uh, mental health resources, uh, you know, with COVID, things haven't been easy. Often, a lot of colleges offer six to 12 sessions per year for free because you're a student at the college. Um, visit your health center for that. They usually have, they'll tell you, here's the, the link to make an appointment. And yes, these resources are usually available with counseling, with the student success centers. I work in a student success center with tutoring, so I'm often taking students there. Financial aid, if you fill out the, the, the FAFSA or the California Dream Act, visit financial aid, find out what scholarships are available to you and get to know your professors. They will help you. If you're facing a challenge, they wanna hear about it. That way they're not wondering, you know, maybe why you missed that deadline. And, and a lot of that ties back to being a teacher, you know, that discipline, submitting stuff on time, you know, developing lessons on time. Um, and so we really, really want to encourage you all to use your resources uh, so that you, you can be successful, you can be a good teacher and connect your own students to resources. Um, so. Uh, you know, if you want to put in the chat, what are some of those resources that you use or you you're curious about? Um, let us know. Let me know. I'm curious what you like to use or who you think is important to your success. And and we have Ingrid has her hands hand up. Ingrid, did you have a question for Janet? Uh, yes, I had many questions. <laughs> um, I was a school volunteer. I'm a single mom of five kids. And during that process, I got hired as a supervision aide and, and been working there ever since. So I fell in love with it. I started to go to school and uh, I'm almost done to get my associate's degree, but I've been asking around, what do I gotta do next? Uh, What's the next step? Okay. And I work for LAUSD and they're not the ones that are gonna volunteer information and say, oh, you should sign up for the internship or for this. No, it's clueless. If anything, I feel a bit hostile at work right now. Hmm. So I wanna get one step ahead of all this. So, I've take, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I've taken child development one, two, and 44 and 45, because I'm interested in becoming a special ed teacher. Well, um, I haven't been able to get the certificate for that because I don't know how to get it either. So you should definitely talk with your academic counselor at whatever mm -hmm. school it is that you're attending. And I would, I would really encourage you to make um, an appointment with a counselor to develop what we call at Cuesta a student educational plan that will give you mm -hmm. a track to follow. Um, and probably, I mean, absolutely w uh, take the intro to education course because that's one of your prerequisites for credentials. And um, I think if you're not getting a lot of support at your workplace, uh, that I would check out the, co the community college because that's going to give you some, they're going to have some insight into your specific area and some expertise there that they can kind of guide you on that. Um, and because the, there's a, a, a big initiative in California to recruit people just like you, Ingrid, people who are in the community of the community already have a deep connection to the children and uh staff and the faculty in the schools. So everything's been really confusing and frustrating this year. You know, I mean, everybody's navigating a really weird space. So I would encourage you to um, seek out the academic counselor at your college and continue with them. And then also um, see what other resources, like what Janet's been talking about, what kinds of um, peer groups. Uh, but yeah, it's, I've tried talking to my academic counselor already, and when I ask, I want to become a special ed TA to start getting my hours in and yeah, getting a full, getting paid full time. He said you would have to go to that specific school and ask them. And then I've been asking them at the school. I've been asking special ed TAs. I've been asking the lady that's in charge of the special ed TAs, and I I keep hitting a dead end, a bump. Okay, well, I, I don't have specific expertise in your area, and I'm not a counselor, 
So what I, I think it might be nice, Renee is still here, I see. I'm wondering if this might be something we could um, address outside of this session. Rosemary, where I literally started typing my oh. email in the chat and I okay. can absolutely meet with Ingrid and make sure we can connect her with the right resources. I'm sorry this is happening to you, but this is a perfect example of what happens to future teachers where you like you think you're right there and you should be able to get the information and it's like people are the gatekeepers of information and they shuffle you around and it's yes. it's not okay and so and and it's not um nothing malicious on the other person's side it's usually just they're a generalist and then you're trying as a counselor you're trying to know every single curricular area and that's really hard to do so i'm nothing against counselors but please i'm going to put my email in the chat Things are really busy for me till Friday, but let's set up a time to meet next week and I can connect you with the people and the resources you need to get going in the direction you want to go. That would be nice. Thank you yeah. so much. And it's good for, thank you, Ingrid, for your question, because I think uh, Renee has far more expertise than I do, but something that we know about the California education system is there are these obstacles in these pipelines and we have this goal of, of training and supporting teachers, but then we find that that things are not working the way they need to. And so it, it's really, I'm sorry it's happening to you. It looks like other people in the chat are, have had some frustrations as well along the way. And, and it's good for us to know because then we can try to address them because we have conversations across systems. So um, Janet, did you have um, more to finish up on yeah. this? Just yeah. really quick, I just want to validate what, what y'all go through because it is very, uh, it's frustrating, you know, having to be bounced around from person to person. And in my role, actually, that is literally my job to prevent that. So I will sometimes walk you to that person or email that person for you um, and just tell you, hey, I'm going to do this, 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 and this to make sure you're not being bounced around um, or I'll walk you to the resource. I'm not an academic um, advisor or counselor, but I'm like that middle person that can literally be like that spider web to everybody else. Um, that connection to everybody else so that you can avoid um, that experience. And at other schools, it's like the academic success coach or like the retention specialist. Um, there's different names and um, th they're pretty common at the community colleges. Uh, but yeah, that's all I wanted to add. And uh, thank you for sharing your experience. And I'm so sorry some of you have had to go through that. Yeah, so you need to find your Janet, everyone. So uh, like she said, they might have a different title, but if there's a tutoring center or a success center on your campus, whether it's a two-year, a four-year, or and anything else, if you, even if it's virtual, there should be someone who can help you navigate these things. I'm going to take a real quick little... Uh, Definition stop. Uh, some of the things that we are that we refer to as educators, I know are words that I had to be explicitly taught. And so just you'll hear this a lot as you start exploring education, curriculum, pedagogy, standards, and assessment. So I'm just gonna say that curriculum is the what we teach, the pedagogy is the how and the philosophy of how we teach. Standards are expectations for content that um, students will be able to know and do. And assessments are a nice word for exams, but not always because I honestly don't give a lot of exams in my classes. So assessments are how do we know that the students learned what we were hoping they would learn? And the these are words that are going to get thrown at you and you'll be like, what are you talking about? So formative assessment is checking in with kids along the way and summative is like a final project. Okay, so those are my, those are just some random quick definitions to throw in there because I'm going to pop back in on curriculum and pedagogy after Janet shares some more insights. And I just wanted you to know what the heck I'm talking about um, or to at least have some context. And now uh, I wanna acknowledge something that is, uh, can often be a very delicate subject and I wanna put out there that I'm not a lawyer. Um, I may not be able to answer questions at this time, but I can definitely put resources in the chat if questions do come up, but I wanna acknowledge that in the work that I do as, a, as someone who works with future teachers, I run into a lot of students who are undocumented, whether that is with DACA, meaning a temporary work permit provided by the federal government or they don't have DACA, 
because they didn't qualify or due to the recent state of um, affairs in the government, they weren't able to renew or apply for DACA. And um, I just want to, you know, validate your experience and tell you that, you know, being an educator, your identity is complex and you can be an educator despite being undocumented. Um, that may look a little different for everybody. Uh, there are resources for you. Um, I know, you know, oftentimes when people give presentations, they talk about FAFSA or financial aid, apply for scholarships. Um, but if you are undocumented, you can go to college, you can, you know, pursue a degree, uh, you can qualify for in-state tuition. Um, there is a thing called AB 540, meaning you qualify for in-state tuition rates because you graduated from a high school in California, you got your GED or you went to adult school, night school, uh, that alone makes you eligible for in-state tuition, not international student fees. And that you can address in your admissions or enrollment office, uh, whether it's at the two year or the four year, all state schools, community colleges, CSUs and UCs uh, have that option for you as an AB 540 student, someone who is undocumented but graduated from California school. So that means that you're, you don't have to pay out of state tuition. So I just wanna put that out there in case you don't know about that. And focusing on that financial aid piece, you might be like, you know, I at least want the bachelors to get that first piece. Um, the California Dream Act is a form that is California's version of financial aid. So that makes you eligible for scholarships at the state level. Um, that means that your school can help you pay for your education. You don't have to be paying out of pocket. Um, and again, the California Dream Act is different from DACA. They actually are unrelated. So you don't have to have DACA to have the California Dream Act. Um, DACA is for the employment piece outside of school. Um, so, so that means for, you know, there's, there are teachers, I have met teachers who got their credential and are working because of DACA. Um, so I just, I just want to address that piece first, that there are resources for you. Uh, if you have DACA or if you need assistance paying for college, always fill out the California Dream Act. And when I show this presentation, the links to California Dream Act will be in the, in the notes of the presentation. And like I said, undocumented people are educators too, whether you, you know that that's being a teacher, um, but being non-DACA, I wanna acknowledge that it is complex in this profession. Oftentimes that means getting creative. Uh, you know, you prepare, you obtain, you do all the steps necessary, but when it's time to get hired, you hit a little road bump. So I just wanna reassure you that you can you know, pursue this field. And oftentimes that means starting your own business, a private tutoring company, a private teaching program, an academy, a daycare. Um, that is one of the many things you can do with your degree. Being non-DACA, you can be an educator. Education is very versatile. Um, and, and, and there's not one size fits all. If you're like, I can't go onto that credential or I can't um, for some reason, get hired out of school because I'm not eligible for DACA at this time. I mean, we always hope, you know, with, if you're staying up to date with the news, uh, legislation, you know, we are the hope is that something will pass and, you know, keep preparing yourself. And so I just wanted to put this out there. All the community colleges, all the UCs, all the CSUs have dream centers. I saw a few people in here from like the LA area, um, a lot of those schools have dream centers. I know somebody put CSU Long Beach, they have an amazing dream center, but all the community colleges are actually required to have dream centers or undocumented liaisons because of an initiative that um, our chancellor passed. Same thing with our CSUs and our UCs. And they all offer free legal services or most of them do because of that initiative as well. So like, for example, at Cuesta, we have free legal resources to the UFW. Students can get help renewing their DACA um, if they wanna apply for advanced parole or if they just want you know, to see what they're eligible for, if anything, um, they will help you through the whole process. And I think I brought up you know, starting your own business. I wanna expose you to Undocu Hustle. Uh, it, it started by Immigrants Rising and Undocu Hustle literally walks you through the steps of how to start your own business, how to apply for an I-10, um, 
And so I just want to put it out there that, you know, there are creative ways to use your degree uh, through Undocu Hustle. Immigrants Rising is like a one-stop shop. Um, if you just type on the internet, Immigrants Rising, you know, how to apply for California Dream Act financial aid, uh, it, like mental health services, everything you can think of that an undocumented student might need, Immigrants Rising has on their website. And again, those links are gonna be in the notes of this presentation. Um, again, California Dream Act, as long as you qualify for AB 540, which I previously mentioned, um, you, you, you're able to apply for that. And again, California Dream Act, visit your financial aid office, ask questions about it. They're required to know how to do this. And Dreamers Roadmap is a scholarship website that was started by Dreamers, by undocumented students, for undocumented people who want to go to college. Um, and so I just want to put that out there. There's money, there's help at all schools now in California because people advocated, people you know fought for these services. And so um, they're there. Um, I also put links to each system's information in case you want to know what each system can offer. Thank you so much, Janet. And and I imagine that there are a lot of people in here who are like, I'm not a, I'm not DACA, I'm not an immigrant, I'm fine. But you probably know someone who might really be able to use this information. And the other thing, and this is as we're starting to talk about what's transformative about teaching, is as educators, we're often the front line with our students. So while you might not need these services you may well and will probably have students who do. And so understanding how some of these systems work as educators, this is something you're probably not gonna get in a teacher preparation program, but this is giving you insight. Perhaps you were not familiar with the fact that, um, that our friends who are undocumented, what they're going through to, uh, to hold down a job or to earn a credential. And so um, learning about other people's lived experiences, is imperative as an educator. So we're, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of go on into um, a few more things here. And I passionately believe this. I believe that teachers change the future. And not only do I believe this from my heart, sorry, um, and it's, it's more than just words, I guess that's what I'm gonna say. I think I just mentioned that I just completed my doctoral dissertation on educators and why do we teach and why it's so important that educators of kindergartners, of preschoolers and everything in between kindergarten through 12th grade, that we are aware that our presence in the classroom with our students has such a massive influence and that if our lived experience is different than those of our, that of our students, we need to be ready to learn about what their experiences are. I identify as a white cisgender female. I have economic privilege on top of that. I am not aware of a lot of the things that my students have gone through. And I know that we're, students are getting messages from their educators as little as when they're preschool and kindergarten that they don't belong in school. And so I'm asking every one of you who's here today to commit to whatever level of education you decide to join in, that you will help students know they matter. If there is nothing else you learn in your teacher education program, if there's nothing else you take from all of these wonderful workshops, center your students and let them know they matter. Everything else will come from there. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know all the details and all the steps to teaching a lesson, but you do have to know that your students matter. Um, so we need you and look at who you're gonna work for right there. I mean, that I prefer the, those expressions to any serious, quiet, sitting in your seat kind of behavior personally. We need teachers who share their lived, uh, who share kids lived experiences. We need bilingual teachers, STEM teachers, special educators. We need people who believe in kids and who don't need to repeat the mistakes that we've made in our educational system over the last 400 years. Um, we've set things up for certain groups of people to succeed and others to fail. Uh, right now in California, over 60% uh, of our teachers are white women. 
okay? And only about a third of our students are white students. So that means we have a complete opposite mismatch between teachers and students lived experiences. And um, I'm not gonna get into all the details on that one, but I'm just gonna share that as something for you to keep in mind. And I would love for us, even though we're gonna run out of time, I would love for you to type in the chat, but don't hit enter. This is a waterfall, probably you've done it and you're like, oh, I've done this before. But think about what is your most memorable interaction with an educator? I, I put teacher, but an educator, maybe it was a principal, a counselor, um, a teacher, a paraeducator. Just take a moment and, and jot down a phrase and just don't hit enter, type it into the chat. I'm gonna give you like 20 more seconds to think about that. And now hit enter and let's see what our experiences have been with, with educators. So go ahead and type in what was your most memorable interaction understanding, okay. Support, compassion, support, love, yes. Expressing yourself when you were hurt, motivation, inspiration, emotional support, 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 guidance, amazing. Oh, I love acceptance. To know there was somewhere out there who believed in me, role model, mentor. I'm getting chills. You can't see it, but I'm like blushing here because those are, those are why we need all of you working with young people in some way or another. Um, so what does it mean to be a transformative teacher? So to transform something is to change it. And um, as educators, we can change some of the things that have gotten in our students' way by making deliberate choices. Um, something that I hope, I hope you're gonna learn about in any of the teaching programs that you explore is um, culturally sustaining pedagogies. And you may have heard culturally responsive, culturally uh, relevant. Guess what? They're all talking about taking children's lived experiences and not just acknowledging them and saying, oh, it's, um, you know, today we're going to celebrate this hero who is a role model in this, um, in this community. It's inviting in the stories, the lived experiences. It's acknowledging that our kids are sources of knowledge that our families who travel from one community to another to work in agriculture can tell us more about the growing season than any science book is gonna tell us. That we have families who bring rich cultural traditions that can only enhance all of our understandings about the world that we're in. So culturally sustaining pedagogy specifically celebrate the linguistic, cultural, and literacy elements of a person's lived experience. Ask your kids what is special about what they do. If a child is sharing that their parent has a certain role in the community, and it may not be something that one would have to go to college to accomplish, but it's a part of the community. It's an important part of the culture ask about it, bring it in, bring that story in. And how can you relate it to the reading that we're doing? How can you relate it to the science that we're doing? Yes, you're going to be given a set of standards and probably a curriculum to teach from, but you can pull in these other ideas and weave them into the curriculum. What does that do for kids? That tells them they matter. That tells them that their parents who may be new to this country, who may have brought them and, and never got an education past high school or even past elementary school themselves. Maybe their parents don't even speak English, which is the common, the common language of the United States, but they have stories to tell. They have skills to share. It's a big deal. Let's celebrate those. Um, and weave them into our curriculum. Sorry, I get very passionate about this because it's just not that hard to do. And it really can 
mean the difference between a student staying in school and feeling like they belong when they see their stories told and they are part of the story. We wonder why kids leave school or turn out or tune out, tune out at school. It's because they don't see themselves in the curriculum. And sometimes as educators, we have to intentionally add them in. So I encourage you to do that. Um, some of the resources you might go to um, that I would encourage you to explore is the concept of a beloved community. How do we get people to collaborate and work for everyone and value each other's stories, even if we disagree? Cultural memory. Um, I would argue that all of our students who are in our classrooms have grit of one type or another. We don't need to teach them how to have grit. Uh, we, we want to encourage them to continue to persevere. Uh, and there's a lot there. Bettina Love, Dr. Bettina Love talks a lot about this and I encourage you to check her out. Funds of knowledge. Like I was saying, there's so many different ways of being smart. I have had students who, oh, they just could literally could not sit in a chair. Like they just couldn't sit still. We're getting, they were distracting the class all the time, but put that kid on a stage or ask that kid to draw a picture about, this, about what we're talking about and no one could touch them. So look for what your students' talents are and build on those. If you've ever had a teacher recognize that in you, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. It takes a little time, but it's worth it. Um, be willing to validate students' experiences Go find the stuff that contradicts what's in your book. So um, history is notorious. Our history books are missing a lot of information. So go out and look for it. There's a lot of resources online. Ask questions. If a kid calls you on something or you don't know the answer, the best lesson for that child is for you to own that you don't know and go look it up and learn it together. So these are what I call critical conversations. And I'm skipping through because I wanna make sure we get to the last couple of points that, um, that Janet wanted to touch on too. Remember, you are a scholar. You're the expert in your classroom. Um, don't let people tell you anything else. You know more than anyone else about the students in your class. Uh, these are some terms I encourage you to explore. I'm not going to talk about them right now, but I encourage you to consider uh, trading these words out for each other. And if you want to know more, you can email me and I'll, I'll be happy to sit down and chat with you. Uh, be careful that if you're talking about student centered, it's you're not trying to make like I visualize this as like trying to smush stuff onto kids and make them fit into a certain hole. So rather than this, Think about this, putting kids at the center will always get you um, a classroom that is engaged and happy. Um, it might not be quiet, but it also it will be a place where students feel welcome and successful and are learning. And so um, going on to uh, Janet has a few last words to share with you and then we'll wrap. Yes, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, so like I previously said, like, you know, I just bombarded you with a lot of resources, but I want you to, I want to encourage you to go to that person you trust on your campus, go to your academic counselor if you have someone that you feel comfortable going to. Um, ask those questions. In my role, it's my job to find out if I don't know the answer. Um, so if they don't know the answer, my hope is that they'll be like, let's find out together. Um, and explore your options for credentials and financial support. Um, I sit down with students, call, I mean, we we work across the street in Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So I have my connections there. I'll be like, hey, you know, can I connect a student with you? Um, don't be afraid to email that person at, you know, Cal, you know, Cal Poly Pomona, CSU Long Beach. Um, if you if you see someone you want to connect with, don't be afraid to email them. That's what they're there for to answer your questions. And um, kind of like what Rosemary touched on that basic skills requirement, attend those workshops. If you see that your school's offering them, if Teach for LA says, hey, here's some follow-up workshops we wanna invite you to, take advantage of those um, and seek opportunities to work with young people. I used to work at the Boys and Girls Club. That gave me so much experience working with young students. That made me also realize I wanna work with college students. That's where my passion lies, you know? Being a teacher maybe is not the route I want to go down, but definitely I like to work with students. And 
at the end of the day, remember it's about them, the student. You know, what do they need? What are they telling you they want? Um, listen to them, um, create that space for them to share their thoughts, develop their emotions. Um, they may not have that space elsewhere and your classroom might be that one safe place for them. And, you know, be open, think outside the box to engage in critical dialogues. It can be hard right now, you know, especially right now. Um, there, there's a lot of uprest right now um, going on. And uh, I just want to acknowledge, you know, our, 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 my black friends, my Asian friends, like there is so much going on around us and we have to be comfortable talking about our privileges. If, if I can't relate to one of my students and I'm uncomfortable having that conversation, sitting down and asking myself, why is that? Teach yourself, Google, educate yourself, watch videos. And so I just wanna challenge you all. And again, find that person on your campus that you can go to, counselor, coach, you know, faculty uh, to help you, you know, explore these options. You're muted, Rosemary. I unmuted it and anyhow, okay, sorry about that. Um, just keep, understand that it is in knowing ourselves. It's important for us to understand ourselves. And like Janet was saying, if we wanna center and support others, we kind of have to know who we are, why are we coming here and to be willing to learn new stuff. And I'm gonna leave you with um, a quote of, Paulo Freire, who would have been 100 years old on Sunday, and he is foundational to my learning in education. I encourage all of you to check out his work. And I, this caps encapsulates what I think of teaching, is whoever teaches learns in the act of teaching, and whoever learns teaches in the act of learning. No one knows everything and we all learn in a space together. I can learn, I've learned things from Janet. I've learned things from people in the chat today. And so I encourage you to approach the profession as one of being constantly in learning mode. Uh, and that's the best way we can serve our students. Uh, so uh, I just, I'm, I cannot believe how many of you all came today. I'm so thrilled to see you. And I love the interaction that we're seeing in the chat. I confess I have not had a chance to read all the chats. I know Janet dropped in. Um, we want to do more than survive. I have it right here on my desk. Uh, Dr. Bettina Love is phenomenal. And I'll add a link in the slides to a really great uh, podcast that she did. Uh, I highly recommend her along with the Abolitionist Teaching Network. If you wanna hear more, if you like what you heard from us today, I want you to check out the Abolitionist Teaching Network. Um, and at this point, we're gonna um, officially end because I know there's other uh, workshops that start at three. However, Janet and I are both available to hang out. The presentation, I'm not sure, I know Renee's going to be uploading everything to the Teach for LA site. If you need a certificate or you have any questions, just email me. Um, our emails are in the um, are in the presentation, but I can copy them, I think, and just pop them down here in the chat for you. Um, we'll see if that works. Yep, there you go. Um, so yeah, so please stay, and if you need to leave. Thank you, thank you for being here. If you wanna hang out, I'm gonna stop the recording and we'll just go ahead and hang out with whoever wants to hang out. Thank I think I have to stop the recording, so okay.